at Swatel as advertised. This is hopefully the talk you came here to see, yes? Wow, enthusiasm, great. Uh, so it's the development metrics you should use but very likely do not. Uh, is anyone familiar with this dish? I heard some folks in the audience talking about it before I began. It is, it's Fruit Loops, yes, great. Uh, so this is, a, this is breakfast, this is a cereal, right? And breakfast is the most important meal of the day, okay? I'm a mother, I say this a lot, right? Who in the audience has been told breakfast is the most important meal of the day? Wow, yeah, it's so true. Is this breakfast going to get your day off to the rip-roaring good start that you deserve? <laughs> As I heard some folks in the audience saying before I began, right, this is a very sugary cereal, yes? So you can eat this cereal and then you, you will perhaps have a, a sugar crash after eating this cereal, right? But it is breakfast, so you would technically be eating the most important meal of the day, right? So that's how I feel about metrics a lot. We hear like you should measure things and every tool that you purchase to track work like comes with these out of the box reports that you spit out. You know you're supposed to like look at them every day or have them in a retro or something like that. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Uh, but to what end, I ask you? Is it just, is the act of measuring what is important no, we're probably working towards a goal of some sort. Uh, so as I talk to you all about metrics, the one thing that I will keep talking about over and over and over again is that you need to have a balanced set of breakfast or breakfast metrics either. Both? Both. Yeah, yeah, both. Okay, so the, uh, the aspects that I think you should think about as you, you start on this journey of hopefully measuring things in a more effective way, I think that you should consider quality, responsiveness, productivity, and predictability so that you get a, a good balanced view of the health of your process and the health of your team and product. Uh, I didn't come up with these four things. It was my good friend Troy McGinnis who is awesome and you should all Google him and he publishes tons of free tools. So. Uh, kind of ripping off of what Dan and Catherine were saying in the previous session. Everything that I'm going to cover in this session is something that you can go do, right? You don't have to pay me to do that. You don't have to pay Dan. You don't have to pay anyone. You can go do these things. And uh, Troy McGinnis publishes a great free set of tools as you want to uh, look at metrics. So back to this. We have these four things. Is there anything missing here? Anyone see anything missing? Yes, sir, in the back. Oh, value. Debbie Downer back there, right? Yeah, uh, that is missing, value, okay? So I'm not actually going to talk to you about how you should measure the value that your uh, product or service is providing to users today. I'm going to talk to you more about like the health of your process, the health of your team. I don't think that you should forget value. And I'll tell you a great story that hopefully will impress upon you why this is important, why value should kind of be the frame through which you view these metrics. Uh, I went into this big, huge organization before. They were very nice people. They said, oh, please come help us. Something's going wrong. We don't know what to do. Great. I show up and the the dude in charge says to me, well, I, I gave everyone this goal of uh, doing things in half the time. That's the goal <laughs> that I gave them. I said, all right, right on, good goal. So then I go out and talk to the teams and they said, yeah, we accomplished that goal. We don't know what the problem is. And I said, okay, can you tell me a little bit about how you, now I'm just curious, right? Like, how, how the heck did you do things in half the time? And one team said, well, we took all of our stories and we just cut them in half or like thirds. And uh, that got us to doing things in half the time, right? All of these things, they, they just gamed the system. They were given the instruction, do things in half the time. So they produced that result, doing things in half the time. 
and they didn't know what the problem was. So I go back to the, the guy who invited me there and said, uh, what were you actually hoping for out of that? And he explained to me that their customer base as a demographic was actually just shrinking. Like, that's not that they weren't getting enough of those customers, but that actual customer base was shrinking as a demographic. And what they needed to do, they needed to have the capability to test ways of getting new customers and getting more from the existing customers while they still had them. They needed to rapidly be able to test those things or they were just going to go out of business. So he didn't actually want them to just do things in half the time, do any old thing. What he wanted was to provide the business people the ability to come up with ideas of getting new customers and getting more from their existing customers and to be able to rapidly test those ideas. So then when you go back and communicate that to the folks who are, are just cutting all their stories, a, a task is now a story, when you go back and communicate it that way to them, they have a much different view on how they should proceed and it doesn't have anything to do with how they track stuff in JIRA, right? Uh, so value is important. I'm never going to talk about it again. <laughs> all right. I am going to now present you with some metrics that you can get started with pretty easily. In order to create these charts and measure these things, you really just need two pieces of information per work item. You need the date that the thing started and you need the date that the thing finished. Just that information. So it doesn't matter even if you're tracking things on paper or in a spreadsheet, I don't actually care that much as long as you have the date that something started and the date that something finished. That sounds so easy, doesn't it? It's not always that easy, right? Like what if you start something and then decide it was the wrong thing to do, you move it back, like do you keep, what's the real start date? All these weird things can pop up and they do pop up and you have to come up with policies about them. If you have some weird thing that you would like to talk to me about, I am the world's worst consultant in that I'm not good at the asking for money for the, for the conversations thing. I just genuinely enjoy having the conversation, so reach out to me and we can talk through whatever is happening with your weird start and finish dates. So, first thing that we can do with those dates, we can create this uh, measure, time and process. So that's the amount of time that it takes to complete one unit of work. People often call this cycle time in our community, but I do a lot of work with um, like hardware and software or um, manufacturing, these types of things, and if you say cycle time to those folks, it means something quite different than what we're talking about. So for the sake of this discussion, I'm going to call it time and process. It's units of time per one unit of work. This is a way to visualize that. It is a time and process scatter plot. It's pretty hideous. Um, so, all right, I'm gonna tell you something. I normally have a different clicker, but when I discovered this room has two screens, it made me uncomfortable with my, my clicker situation, so I don't have my laser pointer, so I'm gonna do this thing that I don't actually like, but can you see it? Oh, there we go, okay. Yes, ah, oh, wonderful. So the x-axis there is the date that the work item was delivered, okay? So the first thing we do when we're plotting this, we find the date that the work item was delivered. Then the y-axis, ooh, oh, I don't get that a second time, great. <laughs> That's the time and process. From the time that we committed to, to work on that work item, we brought it into our team's flow, to the time that we delivered it, that's the time and process. So on the date delivered, if I delivered something today on August 2015, these are a little outdated, and then it took 10 days, I'd end up with a little dot there. Does that, is anyone unclear on how these dots are plotted on this chart? Because if you're unclear, someone else in this room is also unclear. Okay, so what questions could I answer from this? Oh, 
<laughs> this guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's pretty messed up. What's going on with this team? They are inconsistent. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, yeah. So they have things that they're doing in like whatever this is, less than a week down here, and then they have things that are taking two months. Yeah. Oh, sandbagger. Yes, Dan. Yes. And most of those things are people that three quarters of them don't know about the first five quarters yet. Yeah, there's like be interesting looking at some of those big outlines. Yeah. Yeah, there's like a, a cloud kind of at the top and then a blob at the bottom. Yeah. All right, so uh, you have someone, they come and say, uh, I, would, I would like to know when this piece of work will be completed. What answer would you give them? Yes, probabilities. Yeah. So if you're if you're just counting this all as the same work items, what you could do is say how many dots are there total? And this was years ago, so I no longer remember how many dots there are total. And you could say how sure do you want to be? And this person says I want to be ninety percent sure. All you do then is say under what line do ninety percent of the dots fall? Not, there's no standard deviations here. There's no fancy math. I didn't, I mean, literally, I just counted up the dots and drew a line. It's not even in the chart on this line because I wanted it to be a blue line and I could only figure out how to produce a red or a green line in the chart. <laughs> okay, so exactly what you all were talking about. If the person comes, when is this going to be done? If I want to be 90% certain, given the information that I have right now, I tell them just under two months. I don't know how satisfied they'll be with that answer. What we often say is, well, on average, we take this much time. What is the difference between the 50% line and the 90% line? <laughs> yes, <laughs> right? So 50% of the dots fall under this line that's basically at three weeks. 90% of the dots fall under this line that's at two months. So that's a pretty big spread, and I don't know how thrilled people would be if you gave them that 50% confidence interval. What that chart is telling you about is our responsiveness to customers. So a customer comes and says, oh, I need this right away. How responsive are we? That's what we're looking at when we, we visualize that data in that way. You can visualize that data in a different way. You can look at it in this distribution, which, uh, how to read this chart. Uh, at the bottom, we have the time and process. So five days took, zero to five days took, uh, six to 10 days took, right? They're just buckets. And then how often that time and process occurs. So here we very clearly see that we have these two different humps in our distribution, right? Yes? Yes, yeah. Uh, one thing to note about this, because I, I, otherwise I'll get questions afterwards, these are calendar days at the bottom. They are not business days or calendar days. This team that I took this from was in uh, the financial services industry, so they couldn't just say to people, like, it's Sunday, we don't actually allow you to purchase anything, right? So all of their measurements are in calendar days. When in doubt, I always suggest that you look at things in calendar days. So this time in process distribution, same exact data, but now we are looking at it, we are visualizing it in a different way. So here we are being able to tell a story about how responsive we are to customers and we're able to tell a strong story about how predictably we deliver. What kind of things could you do with this chart? We, I showed you two different visualizations of the same data. What kind of things could you, would be easier to accomplish with this chart rather than the previous one? It's a lot easier to give someone an answer from that chart. An answer, 
right? I can draw one line on that chart and say, this is the 90% probability, there's not a bunch of dots, it's easier to give them an answer. Not everybody wants an answer, not everybody should have an answer. So other things that you can do with metrics and with visualizations of this data is you can tell a story. We were starting to tell a story about this team, even though you, you all don't actually know this team. But when I showed the other visualization that shows over time, that lends itself to telling a story about this team. Oh, it, it looked like the cloud and the blob got farther apart over time. I wonder what happened there, right? It can give you options. It can help you talk about options. So if you, uh, maybe you're making a conscious decision, I really want this thing to be done in two days. So you know what, I'm perfectly fine delaying those other things. I understand that those two things might be, might be related. You can uh, indicate decision points, right, by framing things in a certain way and you can enumerate trade-offs kind of like I just did. So for this, this is probably good for answers. If we're trying to tell a story, we probably want to see that visualization of the data over time, right? Stories take place over time. So here, back to this chart again, and we already noticed that there are, there's the cloud at the top and the blob at the bottom, but there's another weird thing about this chart, and it's, it's that these ones that are done in just a couple days or something like that, they kind of just disappear, right? Yeah, kind of get rid of them. So we see the cloud and the blob become more distinct over time. We've already established this, giving folks this answer is probably not, not going to make them very excited. If the person who wants something in a, in a week and we tell them 90% probability of two months not going to excite them. Why not? Because they're probably asking for two different things. Probably the person who has the expectation that something will be done in a week or two weeks or three weeks is probably asking for something different than the person who's asking for the thing that will happen in two months. How we sensitize ourselves to these different work item types is probably through this visualization where we can see that it's multimodal, just like a camel. I guess some camels, not all camels are multimodal. <laughs> so what, what was happening here, uh, this team, you know, highly regulated industry, so they have separation of duties and these things, right? So they handle two different types of work. One is this type of work that we, we see at the left of this chart where those things are done relatively quickly. And another one is failure demand from another team. And what was interesting about those failure demand items, so the other team you know, something went wrong, now it has to go to this team for them to look at what went wrong and fix whatever it is and, and then deploy that into production. What was interesting about those failure demand items is they had to go through this like manual, or I'm sorry, a, a mandatory period of time of uh, observation kind of, right? Uh, even after they found the solution. So that period of time was 45 days. They will never deploy something in less than 45 days. So we definitely should not treat all of those things the same. We shouldn't provide the same confidence interval, which is the probability, uh, for both of those things. So if we throw out the failure demand, what we get is, which you definitely should do, things break, don't fix it. Uh, we get these two lines, right? We get this one, that's the new 90%. And then we get this one, which is the 50%. Now those two lines are much closer together, right? So that's a sign about the variability in our process. So now we're starting to tell a story about responsiveness, predictability, and we're also starting to tell a story about quality, how quality affects our workflow overall. What else could we uh, see from this chart? What if I told you that this team worked on a monthly cadence? What information could you get from this chart? We could start to look at this, right? We could start to look at how many dots occur within a month, which is the throughput. So 
So if the time in process is the units of time per one unit of work, the throughput is the units of work per one unit of time. And for this group, their unit of time was a month. I didn't make it, so no one come up to me in the hallway afterwards and say, but sprints are two weeks. <laughs> so here, if we add in these boxes or numbers or whatever the case may be, we are getting an idea of their throughput, how many uh, actual dots occur there, and we're looking at the variability of the delivery in those dots. So the, we can draw a box, we can put the top line at the top dot, the one that took the most time, and then the the uh, bottom line at the bottom dot, the one that took the least time. Is this a good visualization of throughput? Would someone say like, ah, I need to know how many of this type of story you're going to deliver next week or next month? No, not good, right? Why am I including those failure demand things again? Probably not a great idea to look at all of those together. So if we again exclude those, uh, we end up with this 9, 9, 11, 6, 4, 6, 4, 10, 13. What happened with the 6, 4, 6, 4? It was the summer. A couple people went on vacation. Also, they met me. I came into their lives. I, I made them significantly less productive. <laughs> yeah. Here, I, there were a few people who were like giving me this really ugly glare when I said, just throw out the failure demand, and that's exactly right. <laughs> Obviously, these things are handled by the same group of people. So if they have a lot of failure demand, about how much of the other type of demand do you think they're going to be able to produce in that month? There is certainly a relationship between these two things. Uh, you cannot view them in isolation. Catherine said it earlier, right? The everything affects everything else. I used to have a quote from a philosopher in here about this, right? That the, the system is constantly like acting on itself and people got really angry and I took it out, so. All right, I, here, this is a test. So normal for this team was three or less failure demand work items in a week. Obviously, I made this up. This wasn't their actual thing, right? But it's only Wednesday and school, because normally I do this, and it's not actually Wednesday. I didn't change that. I just always say Wednesday, and it is Wednesday. So it's only Wednesday, and we have already had our three failure demand work items. Uh-oh. We kind of, you know, we're looking on the horizon, and we think there could be two more this week. Bad week for that other team, right? What should we expect from this week's throughput? What should we communicate to our customers? Not to that other team that generates the failure demand, but to our customers that, it, you know, they're asking for something in two weeks. We should probably do some expectation setting there, right? <laughs> yes, we should probably do some expectation setting and say to them, I understand this is really important. We've had these failure demand work items come in. Either we need to escalate this and have someone who has a more systemic view, right, a view up here who knows how those things are going to affect our ability to fulfill our customers' needs. Or you just need to, to realize that we're not going to get to your, your thing this week, right? What will happen to the time and process of the things that are already in progress? <laughs> yeah, this guy knows, right? It's just going to get bigger, going to get longer. When the failure demand comes in, we can't say like, oh, um, I'm sorry, could you like wait a week to go shopping or something or buy groceries, right? We can't say that. We have to address those things right away. So to do that, you have to pull the team off of the work that they're already doing, meaning that those work items will take a longer amount of time. And uh, again, my good friend Dan Bacanti likes to call that flow debt. And I think this is such a powerful concept that we all ignore, right? We measure things by work item type, or we measure uh, for this customer, we have these expectations for that customer, we have those expectations. Many, many teams serve more than one customer, handle more than one work item type. When you are making decisions between those, you are perhaps asking one of your stakeholders to take on some of that flow debt right? 
and the probability of that of having that wonkiness right increases the more you expose yourself to whip right I, I talk about whip like it's this evil risk because in my opinion it is so the greater amount of, of work and process that we have the more exposed we are to that risk of flow debt can anyone tell I have a finance degree yes uh, so this is a, a way that you can uh, you can call these things out. I, I like to present a chart. I like to do things over time, show trends over time as well. And then I like to put little call outs. I want to draw people's eye on what is actually uh, worth discussing at that point. So for this, this is just a stupid one, but it, you know, it's an example. Uh, their average was three of these failure demand work item types. So anything that was above average, I put a pink arrow around it. Uh, the top is the failure demand and then the bottom is the throughput of their customer driven work uh, so there we're looking at if it goes below average or below whatever confidence interval we highlight that another sometimes cool thing to map onto this that I'm not trying to pressure you but you, you can think about it right is the aging of the work in process so you can say the age of our work is increasing meaning we are just continuing to expose ourselves to this uh, then it's multiple types of risk there. All right, uh, why are these arrows pink and blue? Well, obviously it's because the ladies work on the failure demand and the men work on the, no, it's because, uh, I don't know, it has any, everyone look up, look at your neighbor. There are a lot of dudes in this room, are there not? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, so. Uh, I try to pick colors that will ha still have contrast if, you, if you're colorblind or, or you can't see color that well. So uh, red and green aren't like super duper options for that. And if you're using Excel or Tableau or, or whatever, um, the colors that they supply you with, now this is not the case with Google, but don't even get me started. Uh, Microsoft, their Excel, Tableau, the colors that they like provide you are supposed to be the colors that have contrast even if you're dealing with people who uh, have can't see color distinction and since there are so many dudes in the audience I bet there are people out there who can't do that it's more com more common in men and we work in an industry dominated by men so this tells us if we take this view back here right uh, this tells us a story about our responsiveness it tells us a little bit of a story about our predictability and it tells us a story about our productivity how much we are producing as a team all right so I showed you the throughput and I've showed you a couple different visualizations of the throughput now this is if someone right once that answer about throughput this is a helpful way to uh, visualize that however the question that I always get when I have this chart and then a time and process distribution for the time and process distribution we expected to see the lines oh, where's my little where are you bud oh there we expect to see the lines way over here on the right the higher the confidence interval the more to the right we would expect it to be uh, for throughput you're asking a different question right you're asking what's the what's the chance that we're going to deliver six things next week or whatever the case may be so what you're looking for is six or more right not six or less so if you display these charts together the lines the confidence intervals for the time and process will be on the right and the confidence intervals for the throughput will be on the left and sometimes that's uh, just like doesn't make sense to you for a second right so for this team this is a different set of data uh, but I used it because it made a cooler graph so for this team the 85 85% confidence interval was uh, six and 85% of the time they delivered six stories or more to their customers the 50% confidence interval was at 11 so 50% of the time they delivered 11 or more all right so that tells us about uh, productivity and how predictably productive we are right so before we move on um, 
you noticed that they had that bit at the bottom where the two day ones went away. It's just a hilarious story, so I have to tell it, even though it doesn't really have to do with anything. But what they did, uh, they had an executive who was a really cool guy, but he was really in tune with the customers, so he, he would get customer information, kind of like back channel to him. And he would go back to the team and he would say, uh, team, customer wants this now. You got to get on it right away. And they would do that because he talked to the customers all the time. He had a really good idea of what they wanted. What happened to everything else? Flow debt, right? They didn't, the other things all had to sit there and wait. So the team was, knew this intuitively. The guy who was giving them the information, the executive who was giving them the, the information did not know this intuitively. So what they started doing was generating an email. It was like, look, we know that you deal with customers a lot. We heard that this customer wanted this thing right away. We're dropping everything. We're going to work on that. We want you to be equipped to speak to these other customers. So we're letting you know all of the things that we're dropping so that you're armed with that information for these discussions you might be having. Would you believe it? Those expedites just like disappeared. <laughs> It's weird, right? Yeah, yeah. And this team, I love them so very, very much. They're like one of my favorite teams I've ever worked with. They, they started automating the email, but it changing the, like the greeting, like Happy Friday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's uh, close the chapter on that team now. But I just love them, and I'm sure you can see why. So. Uh, you have this idea of when, when you might deliver something, um, you're able to, to build, start building some trust with customers. What if you want to start making improvements in your process? So your customer says, sorry, 21 days isn't good enough for me. I, if you want to keep me as a customer, you need to improve things. So how should you be measuring then? Everything we've talked about, I've talked about, you didn't do much talking up until this point, was about lagging indicators. We have delivered a thing. Here's how long it took. We're using that information to try to peer into the future. I hope Woody covers his ears at this point. I didn't say estimate. Uh, if we want to try to improve our process, we can take those same start and end date and we can start measuring uh, work centers or steps within our process to give us an idea of where we should look to improve. As you begin to do that, uh, I would love it if you could keep this in mind. How much, as we look at the work that we do as an industry, how much gain can we get by, by teaching people to type 10 times faster? Not a lot, unfortunately, right? So this is a visualization of what process cycle efficiency or flow efficiency typically looks like in our industry. So when we take a unit of value, and I, I mean a unit of value, not like an individual task or anything like that, and, and we measure the lead time on that, how long from the customer request to when we deliver that to a customer, what we typically see is around 5% of that time is value-added touch time, 5%. So if you're teaching people to type faster, you are teaching them to improve that 5%. What we should really be looking at is the other 95%, I think, which is wait time, non-value-added activities, right? So we're all here trying to learn about how to develop the best software and all of those things. I think that doing that doesn't always have a lot to do with software. I think it has to do a lot with the, the wait time that we spend uh, within a team or in between teams. I finished my bid, I pass this off to you, or my bid needs that bid over there to run, or whatever the case may be, right? So as we are, are looking at that, we can come up with each of these for each step within our process. We can do the same visualizations for an ind individual step in our process. What I would very much encourage you to do when you are looking at individual steps within your process is not to look at time in process. Because then you are 
probably just measuring how quickly people type. I would encourage you to look at the lead time for that step in the process. So from the point that I handed my piece of work to I know to the point that she delivered it to the next whatever, to the um, marketing communications team that's going to tell our customers about it or whatever the case may be, right? So now we, we might be looking farther out, we might be looking at value chains and we're probably looking at lead time that includes the wait time in between teams, it includes the handoff time and then we're looking at how we can improve that or where that's significantly more than other points in our process. Uh, so if we are going to answer this question, are we there yet? We need to know where in our process we consume the most time. Right, so uh, does anyone here have to go through like any sort of compliance validation or some uh, like check by the FDA or, oh, I'm so, so sorry, I'll buy you a beer later. But sometimes people, this ends up at the end of the process, right? And I've definitely encountered this before and uh, you know, it takes three months. What value will you get out of improving the thing that takes a week or two weeks? If you have a team that's del reliably delivering stories in two weeks and then each one of those stories requires three months to be validated, there is just not a lot of value and trying to get those folks who are delivering the things in two weeks to get them to do that any faster. That's where we have to re-examine our process overall. And uh, yes, so this will tell us where we should focus our improvements, improvement efforts. One word of caution for you. It's not always a work center or a function or a team that is the bottleneck, right? So I'll give you an example. Again, this team, very, very funny, and they were actually cross-functional. So I know everyone loves to say, I work in a cross-functional team. There's a developer and a tester. <laughs> right on, cool. This team was actually cross-functional, as in they had people like from the digital marketing team sitting in their team with them, right? But the unfortunate thing, so that's really cool, they could definitely get a lot of feedback that way. The unfortunate thing was the digital marketing folks, they had other jobs. They had to do some digital marketing, right? So uh, what would happen is we would be, it would look as though some of those stories were taking a long time or the flow was very, Turkey, jerky, even though it was with this team. Why is this team so variable? We don't understand. They're cross-functional. There shouldn't be handoffs. It was because they were fighting. Some of those stories were fighting for the attention of those digital marketing folks. So they basically did have a handoff within their team. Those folks touched two places within the process. They actually did something for another team as well. So both of those teams looked highly variable, even though it wasn't actually any one team that was highly variable, it was that skill set within the total flow. So if we see a high degree and like none of these looks like it's taking a lot longer than the others or everything is kind of just a blob, we should sensitize ourselves to highly blobular things, right? Because that's an indication that it could be a skill set that's scarce or it could be uh, time. I'm, oh, I, I worked with another team that was using a quantum computer to calculate something. I don't, whatever. And they, they had to like wait for time on that machine at multiple points within their process. So yes, I guess I just told you like a bunch of, I said do this and then told you a bunch of things not to do. But anyway, so we're looking into our crystal ball right now. We're trying to get leading indicators rather than lagging indicators. So now we're looking Oh, we identified this point in our process where, you know, we take a lot of time. Now, we, before a thing is finished, based on the whip of that team, we're able to describe how likely it is to be finished in, an, in a whatever amount of time, right? So now we're looking at leading indicators. Uh, there's something cool in this picture. Does anyone spot something cool in this picture? It's a bee. Yes, so I love this quote. It's from a book uh, that I can tell you about 
talking about uh, building computational models of complex adaptive systems, but this quote is awesome. Predicting the movements of the one bee is nearly impossible without the context of the swarm of bees. So just like we were talking about earlier, customer says, I'd like this new thing, whatever, right? We need to know about the swarm of bees in order to describe when we would deliver that thing. How can you learn about the swarm of bees? Uh, I think this is a cool thing to do. So I think you should take account of the things that are in progress each day in each step of your process. This team, so this is a cumulative flow chart, and as some of you know, I'm not like particularly fond of them, but the way this team did it was pretty badass. They used Legos, right? And they just counted up the things that were on their wall, and they used Legos to indicate that every day, and I think they tore down, or you know, tore down the old Legos, like once every four weeks or something like that, but yeah, so they have these Legos, and this is how they they measure the things that are to do doing done. This is a really hard chart to read, so I will move on from Legos. This is how you would see it quite often in whatever tool you have. Has anyone seen one of these charts before? All right, two people, right on. Okay, how do you read this? It's kind of like the reverse of how you think you would read it. So if you take, you have your to-do, you're doing, you're done, and you kind of just lop that over to the right, that's how you read this chart. So the top, if we start at the bottom, let's start at the bottom, that is the things that are done. So, oh, I don't know where it is. The bottom is the count of things that are done. Each day we take a count of things that are done. Then, on top of that, so the next line up would be the count of things that are in review. Yep. And the next line up is the count of things that are in development. And the next line up, and on and on and on. The top line is, is the rate at which things are entering our system because that is the total number of things we have in our system. So the bottom line is the total number of things that we have that are done. The top line is the total number of things we have that are in our system total. That makes no sense, right? I agree with you. So if we look at those lines over time, the top line is the arrival rate, right? Because it's saying how many things total have been in your system. The bottom line is the departure rate. The difference in that week to week would tell you how many things were done this week versus the next week. It's the departure rate. The difference is the number of things we have in progress. This, you can look this stuff up. This is how I think you should visualize that. I don't think that you should be handing people that chart that's incredibly diff difficult to read, but I do think it's important to learn about the difference in the arrival rate and the departure rate for your team. If you have a very high arrival rate and a very flat departure rate, what can you say about how long things will take? Longer and longer. So if you're going to use that, I have my confidence interval from my historical data. It says that 90% is that two weeks. How confident should you be in that two weeks going forward if you see that the arrival and departure rates are diverging severely? Much less confidence, yes. So a way that we can look at the difference between the arrival and departure rate is just by showing this, the net flow. So above the line I have, that's weeks where we finished more things than we started. Our departure rate was more steep than an hour arrival rate. So those things probably took less line, less time. The bottom part is where we started more than we finished. So our arrival rate outpaced our, our departure rate. If you see trends in that difference over time, you can start to change the confidence of your confidence. Right? You can sensitize yourself to changes in your system before you're getting the lagging indicator of the, the average time of process or whatever the case may be. So this tells us a lot about predictability. Yes, seeing that difference in the net flow begins to tell us a lot about predictability. 
this, the, the guy in the back is now standing up with the time indicator sign, so I believe that I'm like quite close on time. Uh, this is just the mathematical way to describe that relationship. You can definitely Google it. There's like a short paper you can read that is great, but they've proven it again and again and again in our industry. All right, I'll start to wrap up. Uh, if you are looking to change that, like I said, a good thing to change is your exposure to risk through the work and process. So I would advocate that you begin to constrain your system. The number of things that are allowed to be in your system if you desire more predictability. And I love this quote, I love this whole book. It says, constraints work by modifying either a system's phase space or the probability distributions of events and movements within that space. So if we want to affect probabilities, we can like shout loudly about it or we can actually introduce constraints in our system and measure how that affects the probability, right? So there we can measure a cause and effect. Uh, I'm sorry I had to bring this up. I understand people ask us things and sometimes we have to take guesses, right? What if you're doing a new product, you don't have historical data to work off of, or whatever the case may be, sometimes we have to take guesses or make estimates. What I'm encouraging you to do is temper expectations, right? So you can say, sure, I'll give you this guess, here's my confidence, I'll give you this guess, but I can tell you about how we're trending, I'll give you this guess, right? So put that guess in a context. and. Um, I like this quote from Pablo Picasso. Computers are useless, they can only give you answers. An answer is an absolute, this is the thing, right? What are we doing in this field? So I know brought up Bitcoin when she introduced me, right? A lot of historical data for Bitcoin, right? Absolutely not. We are doing new things and even the known things, like even ERP systems, right, where those are known things, we are applying them in new contexts. We are using new processes to achieve those same ends. No one can perfectly describe a destination to you right now in the work that you are doing. I have this very bad news for you. So if they're looking for an answer, they have a very, a very bad set of expectations. I'm not from Chicago. What if I walked out on the street and said, I really need directions, uh, I'm going, and someone just interrupted me and said, turn left. I would have no confidence in that answer because I, I wasn't able to give them enough of the context, right? We can't properly describe where any of us are headed, so it is ridiculous if you are asked to simply give an answer you are being asked to do something that is impossible. Uh, so I changed the Picasso quote to say, statistics are useless, they can only give me answers. You should never be giving someone one number. You should be giving them something in context, if at all possible, right? Uh, this is me, I know that I'm out of time. While I certainly would like to adhere to the conference guidelines that you, uh, sorry, give feedback uh, via the app, I would also really like it if you could give me specific feedback, like actual words, not a happy face or a sad face. So if you would like to do that, please come find me. I will still be wearing my Star Trek sweatshirt. That should be pretty easy to pick out. So uh, thank you all very much. I know there's no time for questions, but there's a coffee break, and you can just come ask me your question, like, in a real conversational way. Thank you.